welcome to another episode of Infrastructure Matters. I'm your host, Stephen Dickens, and today we've got Scott Silk from Astadia. Scott, we've been trying to get this video on the books for a while. It's fantastic to finally have you on the show. Let's introduce you to the listeners and viewers here. Tell people a little, little bit about yourself and what you do for Astadia. Great. I'm uh, Stephen. It's been a while. We've been working this for six months, so it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm Scott. Good things so- come to those who wait, right? That's what they say. That's what they say. So I'm uh, chairman and CEO of Stadia, and uh, we were acquired by Amdocs actually in November of 2023. So I'm now running that business as part of Amdocs and uh, on a bigger and larger scale. But my background, I started out as a mainframe guy, worked for Unisys for many, many years, and then uh, crossed over to the dark side and uh, ran startups after that. So my background is a combination of small company and large company. So you mentioned Astadia. Obviously, we're here to talk a little bit about that. Can you just give me the 30-second overview? Obviously, some great news with Amdocs of of late. Can you just give us the sort of 30-second overview, and then we'll dive into what we're seeing in the the mainframe modernization market in general? Sure thing, Stephen. So I joined joined, uh, Astadia nine years ago. And it was based on a hunch a little bit, actually. I, I sold mainframes out of college about 100 years ago. And um, so I knew of mainframes. And when I interviewed with Astadia, I had a hunch that, you know what? The death of the mainframe wasn't mini computers or client server. Maybe it's baby boomers retiring. People my age retiring that's going to drive people off the mainframe. So nine years ago, we set out a strategy to build the ultimate mainframe modernization and migration company in anticipation for the years 2022, 23, 24, when baby boomers started retiring in earnest and we wanted to intercept that demand. So pr- proud to say we were the largest, but also the fastest growing player in the space before we were acquired of it by Amdocs at the end of 2023. So you talked a little bit about it there. The, this is obviously a dynamic market. The platform's just celebrated its 60th anniversary. We're seeing there's there's a demographics component to this market as well. So you've obviously got the kind of technology trends and the underlying infrastructure and the code, but then you've got that demographics piece also playing in. How have you seen the market maybe over the last five years? You mentioned sort of nine years ago. What If you could characterize that sort of five-year period, what's your perspective? Yeah, great question. It's been slowly increasing over the last five years. Um, Up to the point where literally 90 days ago, we saw a huge spike in the market where our pipeline almost quadrupled when it comes to large deals, like Fortune 100 deals. And when we talked to CIOs, we said, why is this happening? And they basically said that you could kick the can down the road migrating your mainframe only for so long. And now you're at the point where staffs are retiring. Um, Our number one partner, who I've never met, Broadcom, is doing a lot of things to make our ROI more compelling right? Um, And now they're at a point where the risk of staying on the mainframe exceeds the risk of moving. And that's why we're seeing such acceleration in the market. It's really a risk. The risk is shifting. And do you see that profile changing? Do you see the kind of dynamic changing? You mentioned sort of 90 days. Is that part of a broader broader trend? Or is it just literally the accelerator pedals being pushed? If I had to be a prognosticator, Tater, I would say that that acceleration is going to continue for the next five years. It just seems like we're really at the front end of a sea change that's going to continue to accelerate for the next five years. So that's an exciting place to be. For sure. And I mean, obviously, with the um, Amdocs piece, that gives you the ability to capitalize on it. One of the big questions that I, I seem to wrestle with, there's modernize on the platform, there's re-platform, or there's refactor. Those are the sort of three big, broad choices. You've obviously got the D- BMCs and the Broadcoms and the IBMs and others in the ecosystem as well, pushing that sort of re- modernize on the platform. There's what used to be the assets from OpenText and Microfocus that are now at Rocket with that kind of re-platform. Yep. And then there's the kind of refactoring, modernize, move it to a more sort of microservices containerized that containerized sort of architecture if that's how i look at the sort of three buckets in the market where do you see it and do you see demand more in one versus the other 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so our technology supports what customers want to do. If they want to modernize the mainframe, check. If they want to move to distributed x86, check. If they want to go to the cloud, that's great. So we can support a hybrid cloud model. But the thing that we um, we learned was quite interesting. We had been a micro-focused partner for over 35 years before we got into the refactoring business. So we were the leaders in replatforming services based on microfocus and our, our own technology, if it was Unisys. When we got into the refactoring business, our tooling is so automated that we actually, let me back up a second. When we, when we launched our refactoring tooling, we kind of thought the demand would be split 50-50 between replatform and refactor. But the mm -hmm. tooling so automated and we do automated testing that we can move people to Java or, or C sharp to the cloud faster, cheaper, and at less risk than a replatform. So we anticipated a 50, 50 split between our refat refactoring and replatforming solutions. It's really like 98% to 2% because when we present a refactoring proposal and a reef, uh, platforming proposal side by side, the customers ask, what am I missing here? If I can get to Java or C sharp, better, faster, cheaper, I'm going to refactor. And that's why our business is really growing. Well, probably the toughest question I'll ask you, so get ready. One of the refactoring kind of challenges I hear consistently is it's not real Java once you've done the COBOL conversion, this kind of Jobol kind of phrase that's out there in the industry. It's really not, it's a janky migration to something that's not really Java on the back end. What's your response to that and the Estadia's response more widely? Yeah, that question comes up quite a bit. And mm -hmm. um, when we look at the Java and the C Sharp that we generate, I probably use, is it, is it going to look the same as if the world's best Java developer developed it? No, no. Is it more than good enough? Yes. So what we tell our clients is let's move to Java Let's get to the cloud as soon as possible and start recognizing that 60, 70, 80% cost savings. And then let's go back and say of the estate that we modernized, we've migrated rather, what percentage of those applications need to be containerized, microservices and so forth. And what we're finding, it may only be 10 or 15%, but the good news is they're funding that 10 or 15% with house money because they're already saving 60 to 70 to 80% because now they're running on, running on the cloud. So it becomes a self-funding type scenario. A lot of these applications have been chugging along in the back office for 20, 30, 40 years. There's no re need to modernize them. But for the 10 or 15% that's customer facing, we would help with the modernization of those. You mentioned 60, 70, 80% there. Is that what you're seeing as the ROI in the case? I mean, if you can maybe, if you can share customer examples, great. If there's kind of, maybe they need to be abstracted to protect the names of the innocent, right. you know, that would, that would also work. But is there any sort of examples you can share of where you've seen those ROI type numbers? Yeah, on average, it's 60 to 80%. And unfortunately, a lot of the clients we win are Fortune 500, if not yeah. Fortune 100. If I mention their name, I, I get a call from their lawyer five minutes after this interview, right? Um, but 60 to 80 is what we feel very comfortable sharing with our clients. Um, the highest we've done are 92, 93%. We have two clients that have broken 90%. Uh, one is a very large federal client and one is a large financial services client but, mm -hmm. but we don't want to you know overcommit. we feel very comfortable with 60 to 80 percent cost savings and if we can get you up into the low 90s all the better so scott we're 10 minutes in it's 2024 and it would be rude of me not to ask you a generative ai question in this in this year every podcast i do has got a generative ai question in there somewhere Where's a Stadia leveraging it? I'm assuming for code discovery, but can you maybe just drill down and talk about really where you, it's embedded in the solution and then kind of how that's transformed the discussion? Yeah, we, we don't uh, talk to any customer within the first five minutes. It's the Gen AI story. And, yeah. you know, our, our Gen AI strategy is 180 degrees opposite of most of our competitors. And, and if you think about it, a lot of our competitors are 60 to 70% automated when migrating COBOL to Java, and they use Gen AI to close that gap to get it to as close as 100% as possible. Uh, as you know, we, we, we ours, when we move COBOL to Java, we're 99.9962% automated. We measure it that accurately. And we do automated testing. So I want to really know what that tiny percentage is at some point that isn't automated, but maybe not on this podcast. 
99.9962. That sticks in my head. Uh, but, but we really, it's, it, it wouldn't be worth it to use Gen AI to get that number up to 100%. So our, our strategy is 180 degrees opposite of our competitors because we're looking at use cases to complement our platform that's already highly automated. So we're looking at code discovery is one we're building out right now. Another one is modernization. A third one might be uh, automated test case development, things of that nature. So we feel that we've got a uh, pretty dramatic lead over our competitors at this point, and we're going to be gen, uh, using Gen AI to maintain, if not enhance, that market lead. And has that changed the conversation? You know, we're obviously, what are we, 18 months, two years into the Gen AI kind of story. Yep. Has that changed the discussion that you're having with the clients? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When Gen AI came out, um, everybody said, oh, my God, we're going to be obsolete. And then I started looking at some of our friendly competitors, and they said, we're going to have what a Stadia has. And I go, well, when? Well, four to five years. And I'm like, well, four to five years is an eternity, right? Mm -hmm. So what we see is there's, a, there's kind of a, a huge Gen AI buzz, and it was a big hype cycle. Now it's kind of dovetailing back a little bit when reality sets in. But we do believe that Gen AI is for real, and it's going to have a big pack, impact on our space down the road. But it's probably going to be three, four years down the road rather than six months down the road. So I've been tracking you guys for a while. We've been chatting on and off, getting briefings. Huge moment in the company's history recently with the acquisition of Amdox. Tell me what that means. We've talked about it off camera, but tell, tell me and the listeners what that means from an investment point of view, a reach point of view, a scale point of view. Because from my point of view, the way I look at it is putting that, wood behind the arrow of your solution is going to be impactful. But am I thinking about it in the right way? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I We've gotten to a situation where we were the largest and the fastest growing player in the space. And we started winning deals, 30 million, 40 million, 50 million. Those were really good sized deals for a company our size. Um, but when you're dealing with the Fortune 500, if not Fortune 100, they really wanted the backing of a $5 billion company. And we have that now with Amdocs. The second thing that Amdocs uh, brings to the market um, is dominance in telco and financial services, two verticals where there's just a lot of mainframes. And uh, we are a horizontal company. We, we we sell in all verticals, but we see a lot of opportunity in financial services and telco where, where Amdocs is dominant. And then finally, you get a kick out of this. When we move somebody's workload to the cloud, we earn trusted advisor status over time. So once they're in the cloud, the next question, do you do managed services? Do you do DevSecOps? Do, what, are you, what are you gonna do for modernization? Predictive analytics? And we'd say, well, we have a partner for that. We have a partner for that. We have a partner for that. Now we're vertically integrated. So we can go soup to nuts all with Amdocs. That doesn't say we still don't partner with all our, our close partners like the uh, Cognizance and the Capgeminis and the Accentures of the world. But for clients that want vertical integration, one throat to choke for the whole project, that's, that's where Amdocs brings capability as well. And, you know, we joke that for every dollar we'd earn moving people to the cloud, we probably would leave three to five dollars on the table for their digital transformation strategy. With Amdocs, we can now enter, we can now participate in that. So it gives you both the reach and the into those two key verticals, financial services and telco, but just is as maybe the sort of beachhead for a wider Amdocs conversation as well. Correct. Correct. And they've also done wonders for our R and D budget and our go to market budget. So that's that's uh, pretty cool as well. So Scott. Uh, CIOs and CTOs, they're wrestling with this game of three-dimensional chair seats. Do I move off the platform? Do I modernize on the platform? Do I refactor? Do I replatform? This is typically the heart and lungs of an operation. You know, they're thinking, I've got to get that data under control. It underpins a whole piece of my system in, of engagement of, as well with clients. If you were to boil this down, what would those three key takeaways be and the three sort of big tenants, if you will, of your sure. conversations with those senior leaders. Yeah, so it's a big decision when you're unhooking the heart and lung machine and you really have to get it right. So our strategy is all based on risk mitigation. And that's what CIOs are looking for. So first and foremost, we're 100% focused on mainframe migrations. That's all we do. The mainframe is a complex beast, so we really need to live at 7 by 24. And unfortunately, in some cases, we do live at 7 by 24. Secondly, it's all about experience. 28-year-old um, MBAs are great for some things, but not necessarily the mainframe. So we are looking for 
people with 20, 30 years mainframe experience. Mm-hmm. And you always recognize in a Stadia consultant when they show up because they're the, they can be seen as the no hair group, the gray hair group, or may use hair products group. So we haven't experienced <laughs> much. And then, and then finally, our tech, uh, both for refactoring and replatforming, is the most scalable in the industry. So we like to say we scale higher, uh, we perform better, we do it at less risk, and we do it more cost effectively than anybody else. So when you add up those three things, the technology, the, the experienced people, and the, uh, the focus, we boast a 97% project success rate based on referenceability dating back to 1994. And then uh, we always say tongue in cheek that it's a big decision for CIOs. And when they're successful in migrating their mainframe, they're going to get called into the uh, CEO's office for accolades. Unfortunately, the opposite is also true. And when that happens, the conversation's a bit different. Well, Scott, it's fantastic to finally get you on camera and talk about this. We've been talking for a while. It's a fascinating story for me. Every time we talk, I learn something. And I hope the listeners and viewers really enjoyed this conversation. You've been watching Infrastructure Matters. I'm your host, Stephen Dickens. Please click and subscribe and do all those things that help the algorithm. And we'll see you next time for another episode. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Stephen.